Well, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to Productivity in C++ Game Development, uh, ACU 2023. My name is David Lee. And I'm Keith Stockdale. Um, I am the Game Dev Product Manager at Visual Studio. Um, so I work with a lot of game devs uh, like Keith, um, ranging from AAA studios to indie gamers, um, really anyone who is um, doing any kind of game development. That's kind of um, the folks that I interact with uh, on a daily basis. Cool. And Keith? Uh, yep, so I am a software engineer at Rare. Um, I work on the engine and rendering teams, working on games such as Sea of Thieves and Everwild. And I mainly spend my time working with GP, GPU uh, type systems like uh, GP particle simulations and the like. Great. So um, we have a pretty packed and exciting agenda for everyone today. So, um, first, we'll Take a deep dive inside Keith's mind, um, inside the mind of a AAA game developer, uh, as Keith shares up some tricks and tips up his sleeve uh, when it um, when it comes to NatVis debugging, um, how to use it, and we'll of course give a few examples of how NatVis is used in Sea of Thieves and um, how Keith um, handled these tips and tricks to make his debugging experience even better. And um, after that, we'll take you through some really, really neat and interesting productivity boosters um, that Keith and I thought were great to show everyone here in ACU. Um, some, um, just taking everyone around um, through the developer inner loop and highlighting all the tools that we thought are Great productivity boosters. So um, without further ado, let's get started with Nathis. Um, awesome. Keith, please take us through a crash course. Awesome. Let's get going. Um, so first up, what is it? It's not something that most people have heard of from the get-go, um, but it's essentially a programmer-defined visualization of data within Visual Studio. So it's what defines how your your objects are displayed in the variable debugger windows, like the watch window or the locals window. Um, it's marked up in XML um, and is fully available to anybody to write extra visualizations for. Um, an example for uh, an AdVis visualization is, is here. Um, this is what stood vector could look like in the NatVis file that is provided by Visual Studio. Um, and if it looks a bit weird, don't worry. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, uh, not this visualization line by line so that we can get an understanding of what's going on. And before we go any further, um, we should know why we're wanting to learn this. And the main reason is to reduce cognitive loads while debugging. Um, I don't know about any other industries, but in games or working in Unreal Engine like I do, uh, debugging can be quite, um, can take a, a large load. There's, there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of information to parse through just to find the actual issues that you're looking for. So anything that helps to reduce cognitive load and make uh, data visualization a lot easier, I'm all on board for and I'm going to advocate for. And also, it removes the need for everyone to know the implementation details of your types. Uh, you don't need to know the underlying implementation details of std vector to know that there are three or four elements in it that have a couple of strings. Um, and all of this is to say, we want to work smarter and not harder. So, uh, so let's kick it off with a simple example and just to drive home what is going on with NatVis and how much it does for you versus just without with visual versus Visual Studio without a NatVis visualization. So for std vector, here we have a vector of strings. Um, hello, welcome NatVis. And whenever you look at that in the Visual Studio debugger windows, you'll see this. And I'm sure everybody is very familiar what a std vector looks like in the debugger. However, um, do you have any idea what might happen if uh, Visual Studio did not provide a visualization for us, Dave. Yeah. So, how much is how much of this is 
Nav is and how much of it is just plain old Visual Studio? Um, this is almost entirely uh, NavViz. So this is what it would look like if you didn't have visualization. Um, you just see the allocator, which is the implementation detail that is in the standard library written by Microsoft. Um, so NavViz does quite a lot, and it's something that is entirely programmable by us, and it's something that we should probably spend a bit more time um, using to improve our debugging experiences. Yeah, we should let Navis do the heavy lifting for us. Yeah, absolutely. OK. Um, and before going any further, just a few notes on getting started with working with Navis. Um This lovely link here will bring you to the documentation that will describe all of what I'm going to describe today and a lot more as well. Um, it's a great resource and has plenty of examples to explain what is going on. Um, and if you're like me and you work in Unreal Engine, this is where the uh, Unreal NAF is, is, is found in your engine install. And you can open it up and have a wee play around with the visualizations that you have there. And whenever you're writing NAF, it's this is not enabled by default. So whenever you're writing it, you will not actually see error messages for issue, errors that you make while writing NAFIS. So go to this location in Visual Studio. So it's in the Tools menu and just turn on NAFIS Diagnostic Messages so you can actually get a good feedback loop and know where you go wrong. And also use Visual Studio for the best editing experience. Uh, if you use a different editor, every time you change the file, you have to manually reload the watch window, which is a pain. But whenever you're using Visual Studio to edit, every on save, it'll reload all of your watch windows, and you get all the nice visualizations auto, uh, like, uh, auto refresh for you, which is quite nice. And also, um, there's IntelliSense for NatVis as well. So as you're typing, you get all the nice uh, syntax highlighting and, and the... Um, and the he like helpers, so like it tells you what is valid in what context, which is great. Okay, on with the crash course now. Um, and I think the best best place to start is tearing apart the T array visualization. Um, so T array is Unreal's analog of std vector. It is simply just a resizable array, and we'll go through the side by line, and hopefully by the end we'll know what's going on. So. Every visualization starts off with a type header, um, and in it, you just specify the name of the type that you're going to be providing visualization for. Um, and it's XML, so we have to use escape characters whenever we see angle brackets. So we're making a visualization here for a template. Therefore, instead of using angle brackets, we have to say ampersand LT for less than, and then end up with a semicolon. And we use the asterisk to character to match any template argument. So this is going to be a visualization for every uh, in instantiation of TRA under the sun. And there's two asterisks here because of the it takes a type and it takes an allocator. And then we have display string. Um, and this basically gives the value of the type in NatVis, in the watch window. Um, so whenever you have your object in the watch window, uh, beside it will have the value col column, and this is what's going to be displayed. Um, and you can use C++ expressions in this as well as just text. So at the top, we do, uh, um, if the array is empty, then we can we can actually use that. We can actually define that with a condition attribute, and it'll just display empty. But if we find ah yes, it's a valid T array, and the capacity is greater than the actual size, then we can do num is equal to, and then in curly braces, we can access the TRA's member for its size, which is array num. You can do quite a lot of things here by you know, setting your condition and then um, letting NatVis display whatever you want to display. So you spend less time digging through um, the potential variety of displays that might come without NatVis. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then we have expand. This is fairly self-explanatory. Um, it defines what is displayed when you expand out the object in the watch window. So here we have uh, a TRA called not empty. We have four elements in it. And whenever you press the arrow to expand it, then you see all the additional items. So as Dave said, yeah, the display string is great for 
uh, making sure that all the information that you, the most important information is most is front and center without having to actually go into it. So like making sure all the more important information is front loaded. And then we have the magic, which is the array items. Uh, so array items is an expansion, which uh, takes a size and a pointer. Um, and what it will do is it will dereference that pointer and display the item from dereferencing it and then increment the pointer and I'll do that size times. Um, so in this case here, we provide the size of it and the value pointer is this thing, which is pointing to the allocator data. Um, one thing that I must note is that you see the dollar sign T1 and dollar sign T2 here. That's how we refer to the actual types. So uh, the allocator is actually just some void, uh, it's a void pointer, some memory, and then to actually get the information out, we need to cast that void um, pointer to get the actual type out. And we use that, we do that by using dollar sign T1 to, for the first template argument and dollar sign T2 for the second. And of course, remembering that we have to escape, we have to escape our angle brackets with ampersand LT and ampersand GT. And that's about it, really. Um, so at this point, we know how to create a, a fairly basic visualization. Um, we know how to work with template classes. And we know how to conditionally display information as well um, and display data, data as an array in the watch window. Um, but there are a couple of more. There are a couple of more things that I want to show before getting into the examples and the tips and tricks. Uh, the most important of this is custom list items. Um, this is incredibly powerful. Um, it allows you to write some custom logic that will jump around in data uh, as you see fit. So you don't need, so with array items, the problem is it just works for contiguous memory. There's also linked list items, but of course that requires you just to jump from pointer to pointer to pointer. And um, there's also tree list items as well. So if you've got like a binary tree, it'll do that as well. But for anything else, say um, a hash map um, where you'd be jumping around in memory quite a bit, there is custom list items and it can do a huge number of things for you. Um, it supports loops, it supports branching, supports uh, logical and arithmetic operators, and it supports a very limited but useful set of functions to call as well. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about it later on. So Keith, so with custom list items, you, you write a lot less debug code. <laughs> you absolutely do, yeah. So it allows you to create very, very specific visualizations. And we'll, we'll get on to that later. Um, so to give an example of this, uh, this is one of the visualizations that uh, Visual Studio provides for stood ranges iota view. Um, and one iota view is it's simply just two ints. Uh, so you have val, you have the value, and then the bound. And the whole point is in a for loop, you can iterate from the value up to the bound. And of course, this isn't actually stored in memory as an array from um, number from value to bound, that would be silly. It's simply two ints, but for us to, so therefore we can't actually use an array li, um, list items or anything else to display the range. Um, but instead what the um, Visual Studio does is do custom list items. Um, and if you squint, kind of looks like uh, C code, kind of looks like you're programming here, even though it's XML, yeah. it's kind of weird. <laughs> So we first declare our value, which is going to be initialized to the underscore value, which is the um, the member inside the iota view, and then we just loop and display and display the, that value and in, increment the value as we go along, and then we just break out of it whenever we reach the bound. Pretty simple. Um, and then format specifiers. Uh, these change how certain values are displayed, um, and they have the form of value, comma, and then this format specifier. Um, this isn't technically just for NatVis. You can do this here in your watch window as well. Um, and there are a couple of cool versions of it. So one of the, one that people might be most familiar with is comma h, which will display your integers as hex as opposed to decimal. Um, but some other interesting ones are uh, exclamation mark, 
if you put that in, it'll force the raw view. So it'll just throw out any visualization that is provided to you in any NatVis files that you have. Um, and then if you're looking at pointers and you really hate seeing most of your watch window taken up by the address of the pointer, you can just suppress that with um, comma NA. Um, and then there's, there's a whole range of them. Um, in the documentation I pointed to before, and um, there's a it lists all of them, and there's some really interesting ones there if you have if you want to take a look. Um, and here's an example of it with our with views. So what a view is, it provides an alternate visualization for a type. So say you have your base visualization here for our type called my cool type. Um, extremely uh, inventive naming here, and we just provide we just output. Uh, the int and float members for it. But then if we want to uh, allow you to view it as hexadecimal, then we provide a separate view for that. Um, and in it we do um we we do the we do the work to actually display the int and the float as a hexadecimal number. And then as you can see down below. So we to specify a view in the watch window, you do your comma uh, and then view and then name your view. And there are there are quite a few in the STL. There's you can have a simple view of a vector. Um, there's a, there's a couple that's provided in Unreal as well for the handy uh, handy shortcuts to members of actors and such. And then this is our last thing I want to talk about before getting into the tips and tricks is synthetic, um, and this allows the creation of a synthetic expansion. Um, it's a, it effectively, effectively allows you to pretend that there's an object there and then do some custom, uh, just basically pre pretend that objects exist even though they don't. So in this case here, um, fake object does not exist and neither does it have a member called other fake variable. Um, these synthetic, uh, the synthetic node is very useful for grouping data. So say you have like a large type and you want to group data by uh, their use. So like some some data might be just for debug, some might be for the game logic, some might be for um, some visualization data, and you can just group all of those nicely into synthetic groups, which is very useful for um, making sure that data is really easy to find in the debugger. So so Keith, what, what are some common synthetic expansions that you use? Typically, uh, I yeah. As I said, um, I typically use it for grouping. It's really, really, really handy for grouping um, and providing like aggregate information. So, say your type has two members, and together they make a data point. Essentially, um, it's really nice to use the synthetic node to actually um, make something for the, for that uh, aggregate information. Um, okay, and with all of that, let's talk about creating our first visualization. Um, suppose we have a data type like this. Um, it's kind of trying to be a really naive version of PLF colony. Essentially, it's a vector that uh, tries to optimize insertions and removals. Um, so inst instead of removing data in the middle of a list, it'll just m um, mark it as dead or alive. Um, Okay, so we've made this a uh, very naive thing, and then we write some code for it. Um, so we have a free list vector of strings, and in it we have hello world from Accu, and then we want to remove world. Um, do you have any idea, Dave, what this is actually just going to look like as it is in the in the watch window if we have a look at it in Visual Studio? Yeah, probably not not too great without specifying our visualizations. Correct. So. This is what it's going to look like. So you can you can work out what's going to what, what the actual state of the free list vector is. But whenever you look at the data, you can see world is still there, obviously because this vector works by just marking it as dead in a in a uh, parallel array. Um, so you could you could definitely put your head through some pieces and figure out what the actual state is here. And that might be good enough for you. But for me, I don't like to think too hard whenever I'm doing this type of stuff. So we can do better, right? And this is one way of doing better. So custom list items comes back in again. Um, so squint again, and we'll see we are declaring two variables, and we're just looping uh, from the beginning of the data vector to the end and just checking and only outputting the information if the if the um, element is marked as alive. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, and then whenever we apply that, uh, we get this, which is much easier to parse. So we can see our size is three, not four. Um, and we can see that the elements are hello from AQ. World is not there. It's been removed. Uh, um, so that's that's really the power of it. It's great. Um, it means that people who use your fancy types don't actually need to understand the implementation details. You can just uh, submit your NatVis file to your version control of choice, and everybody will have it, and everybody will be thankful for it. Yeah, and, and we let NatVis do the heavy lifting. We no longer have to do mental calculations or sometimes even guesswork. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so that gets on to some tricks, I guess, that I, I, I use in my day-to-day -day life working in Unreal Engine and on Sea of Thieves. Um, so just for the sake of example, we have this scenario where we have a very large TRA. So TRA is std vector, um, and an actor is, a, is Unreal's game object, effectively. Um, and in this scenario, we think that the problems that we're seeing in the level are down to the invisible actors, the actors that aren't being rendered. There's something dodgy going on there. Now, if I was to look at this in the the watch window and have to go through all 226 elements trying to just figure out which ones are invisible and which ones aren't. It wouldn't be very fun and it wouldn't be very, it, it would take a long time, it'd be tedious and it just, it's, it's just not very productive really. Um, but we can do better. Spend your whole day. Yeah. <laughs> Spend your whole day going through all of these and marking down which element indices are the invisible ones before going on. Yeah, that'd be rubbish. Um, we can do something a bit better though. Um, so we can filter arrays. Um, so here we're actually combining a lot of the stuff that I uh, described in the in the crash course. Um, so we're using a view here. So this uh, visualization would actually conflict with anybody else's uh, T-array visualization. So anybody can opt into just saying, okay, I want I, every time I see an array of actors, I can also opt in to see the invisible actors using the view, which is great. Um, and then we just have a custom list items and we're just looping through every instance here and just checking to see if the actors be hidden property is set to one. And if it is, therefore it's invisible and we output it using the item element. Fairly simple. Um, and whenever we do this, we go from 226 items down to 13. Much That's more manageable. Yeah, much more manageable. Uh, and it's really not that much code. Um, I know I know XML coding and XML is a little bit funky, but once you get into the swing of it, you can do a lot of cool stuff like this. Um, but we can do a little bit better as well. Um, so anybody who's worked with Unreal knows how big Actor is. It is a monumentally huge object, um, well, type, I guess. Um, and finding specific, the specific properties that you want is going to take a long time, um, usually. Um, so in this case here, we find, okay, so we find our invisible actors, um, and we have reason to suspect it's due to one of the components on the actor. So we want to find the array of components on each actor and just check them. Um, again, so we're looking for a needle in a haystack here, and which is tedious. So we can automate this. We can do a bit better. Um, and this is a bit simpler than the previous one. All we do is just name the name the properties that we want. So we want the root components and then all other owned components. And whenever we do that, we have all of the information that we want, and it almost display. It's, you can almost see all of it in one slide, which is just great. Um, so we're down from 226 items down to 13, and then we're instead of looking at a few hundred properties, we're only looking at two arrays, which is great. That that's brilliant. So Keith, tell us a little bit about like like the benefits of Navis. Um, you're writing a lot less debug code. Well, what else does does it help you with? Um, it just as I, as I said before, um, it reduces the cognitive load that you need. Um, people shouldn't be having to calculate things or keep a lot of things in their head while going through codes. It should just there should be nice displays. This is why we have 
uh, good. Uh, we, we try to use as much tooling as we can to help us in our day-to-day -day lives. And the, and NatViz is honestly a really great tool. Um, and I feel it's quite underutilized. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think what Keith and I want to show everyone is a combination of um, workflows and methods that um, Keith uses every single day to to reduce the, the cognitive load, but also other um, other little tips and tricks. Um, that kind of falls in the same vein. So there is um, a bunch of productivity boosters um, that Keith really likes using that has recently been released in Visual Studio. Um, and before we go on with this, I want to say a special shout out to everyone who, um, who thought it was a, a new ticket, suggesting a feature or um, filing bug tickets through developer community, whether you filled out a survey or interacted with us on Twitter before. Um, a lot of these features that we're showing is the, the direct result of talking to, um, to devs like everyone here. Um, so yeah, special shout out. But um, you know, stay in the realm of debugging. Let's get started with breakpoint management. And um, I think we all know that managing breakpoints could be a pain. Um, Keith, tell us about what you're doing here. Um, yeah, so in this example here, um, I'm, I'm using the DirectX samples uh, code on GitHub. Um, and just for the sake of example here, um, I think that the orientation that I am calculating is wrong whenever we go beyond 180 degrees. Um, now, obviously, you can't just stick a breakpoint whenever we're calculating the orientation because that would just that would just hit every frame. It's not very useful. Um, you, there's there's no way of doing it. Now, normally in this case, you might just do a bit of um, printf debugging, just logging stuff out at that point. Um, but you can do a bit better. Um, so in this example here, what we're doing is we're setting down a trace brace, a trace breakpoint, um, which simply just it does not break, so it, it continues code execution, and it just logs out, we hit 180. Um, and then we set another breakpoint, the actual one we care about, but instead, um, we set it to only enable once the other one has been hit. Um, so therefore, we, we can actually, we don't actually have to write this here code of, okay, checking if we're going over 180 degrees, setting a breakpoint for there, waiting for that to be hit, and then setting the breakpoint we care about. We can do it all in one. Um, and it means also we don't have to write debug code like uh, writing a branch that will then, that we can set a breakpoint on. We can actually do that logic within the breakpoint framework itself. So it reduces it reduces the amount of debug code we have to, we have to write and reduces the amount of times we have to stop and then write new code and then recompile to iterate on this. We can just do it all with lovely breakpoints. Yeah, it reduces your iteration time, um, but also reduces the time you spent removing those little bits of debug code everywhere. Yeah, I, I, I'm probably guilty of accidentally submitting um, some if statements that are just checking for things so I could set a breakpoint. It's probably happened at some point. <laughs> this, this, this removes that, that danger altogether, which is great. Right, you can um, spend spend less time writing debug code and um, letting the debugger do the work for you. Um, so okay, so now you have even more breakpoints than before. You have yep. breakpoints that uh, conditional depending on other ones. Um, yeah. how, how how do we manage them? Um, well, we have this thing called groupings now. Um, so yeah, so we've got lots of breakpoints at this point, and then we want to go and work on something else. Um, but we don't want to lose our initial breakpoints. Um, I know before this, I would have huge lists of breakpoints that I just disabled um, manually and re-enabled whenever I needed them. But instead of that, what we can do is we can create groupings and we can like name them as well. So in this this example here, I'm just naming uh, a, a, a breakpoint group just called camera debugging and then moving my two previous breakpoints into it um, just for 
later use and just disabling the group. So I actually know what those breakpoints are going to be used for. Like, uh, So whenever I come back after the weekend and try to figure out what those breakpoints are even for, um, I actually know because I've given it a name. And as we know, names are quite powerful. Yeah, this uh, this lets you, you know manage your breakpoints, especially as that you know as that list of breakpoints just grows and grows. Mm -hmm. um, you can activate a bunch of breakpoints at once, um, deactivate it. Just, just nice, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and with one of the new updates, you can actually depend. You can write breakpoints that depend on an entire group as well. So it, the groupings themselves are essentially just um, aggregate breakpoints themselves, which is kind of cool. Yeah. All right. Um, let's move on to one of the next features that we want to show is macro expansion. Uh, this one, uh, Keith holds dear to heart. Um, want to tell us why? Um, for anybody who's worked in Unreal, you know how prevalent macros are, and you also know how fairly complicated they are. Um, and also, for the case of generated body and other such uh, macros that make up the reflection system in Unreal, it was actually very hard to find the code that was generated from that. Um, but yeah, with this, you can just you can just expand it out inline and then see what's actually being generated. And this is very useful um, for both the reflection code, like generated body, and then as a rendering engineer, I do a lot of work with Unreal with a, with Unreal's render dependency graph, and that's all of the shader binding code. There is very macro heavy, and sometimes whenever you make a mistake, it is very hard to figure out what mistake you made because it's down in several layers of macro code, and this helps immensely with figuring out what you, what you did what you did wrong. Yeah, exactly. Um... For, for for macro expansion, this is um, I, I want to reemphasize re um, what I said a little bit earlier today. Um, the the team at Visual Studio focuses a lot on on customer requests, um, and this is actually the result of working with Keith um, when I first started chatting with Keith and the team at Rare um, a few years ago. Um, we we learned Keith didn't like memorizing. The super heavy macros that Unreal Engine has sometimes. Um, so that we built in a feature that allows you to copy and expand your macro. So, Keith, do you typically um, copy it or expand it in line? I typically expand in line. And because if, whenever you expand in line, you, you get all the niceties with IntelliSense, you get all the nice red squigglies, you can see all the issues. And then once you're done, you can just control Z and get back to the way it, it, it was with the macro. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let's go on to the next feature, which is uh, all in one search. This is one of the newest ways to search in Visual Studio. Uh, we combine all the power of the O search, but put it in one convenient place. Um, so keep, yeah, you are a Control T power user. Yeah, well, I, I heavily depend on it at least. Um, I use it a lot just to find definitions of things to go to certain files. Um, yeah, I, I find it to be a very efficient way of navigating very large solution files. Right. So with this, uh, it's still a preview feature. Uh, you have to go to tools options and search for the word search. Um, you know, check that box and restart Visual Studio to get all in one search to show up. Um, once it's in, in, enabled, you can um, either click on the search box or click uh, use control T to search for a feature. Um, here, uh, if you search for a particular symbol, you can um, filter it by file, by types, or members. And um, there is a handy little preview window that lets you um, go def definition, um, and allows you to do some simple refactoring options like renaming. Um, Keith, like this, how has this affected your work so far? Uh, the preview window has affected it quite a bit because it means that so the the I guess the problem that I didn't um really realize before was whenever you do control T, you go to the actual file. So you actually get pulled out of where you're working in. But with the all-in-one search, it means that you can just 
go to the definition, do some light editing, and you're still at the original file that you were on before. Um, so that's um, I find that to be very useful. Yeah, um, just, just like Navis and the debugging features we showed, um, I think we picked all the features for productivity reasons. Um, because uh, throughout all the times of um, chatting with game developers like Keith, uh, a big things that I've learned and also the team at Visual Studio learned is um, how increasing productivity can significantly enhance um, your your day to day work, especially in game development, where you're working with a complex code base um, and complex and large code bases. So um, next. We have HLSL tools. This is a, a very popular marketplace plugin um, for editing shader tool, uh, shader files. Keith, can you give us a little quick brief intro to HLSL? Um, yes, yeah, so HLSL is direct access shading language, effectively. Um, and in Unreal, uh, this is what you would see if you try to open a shader file no, and the reason for that is because uh, Visual Studio does not map .ush, which is Unreal Shader header, and USF, which is Unreal Shader file, um, to the HSL editor. So you just you get no syntax highlighting whatsoever. But with the HSL tools uh, expansion, you can actually map your the, the USF and USH files to the HSL editor, and whenever you reload the editor, you see all of the lovely syntax highlighting highlighting the HLSL tools gives you. Um, it's a it's a phenomenal way of uh, improving the HLSL writing experience in Visual Studio. Um, I know before this, um, a lot of people in my team, they would have like a custom config in something like Notepad++ um, to get at least some basic syntax highlighting for HLSL, or just try and treat the file, the file as C code and just sort of squint a little whenever you see texture samples. Um, so yeah, the, the, just just from enabling this, you get a large benefit. Yeah, and when, once you map that extension, um, the, you can also map your virtual directories. Yeah, so in this example here, um, we see that the red squiggly on HLSL tools can't find this virtual head, this virtual directory. Um, what you can do is you can create a JSON file in the root of your project, and you can make the, the mapping. So we're saying the virtual directory slash engine is actually at this absolute address. And whenever you reload Visual Studio, then it finds the header and also it finds the functions that are defined in the header. So transform local to world here is is um, now known DHSL tools. It knows what it is. Whereas before it was uh, gray squiggly saying, I don't know what to do with this. Mm -hmm. And then IntelliSense, what would we do without IntelliSense? Um, so HSL tools gives us first class uh, access to IntelliSense, which is like code completion. Um, it will tell you uh, function prototypes, all, all of the good stuff that you expect while coding with C++ or C Sharp in Visual Studio, you get in HSL now, which is great. Yeah, this is, you know, uh all the power comes from HLSL tools, um, including uh, this example where you can see Keith good definition, yeah, uh, particular symbol. Yeah, so you can just use F12 as you would in Visual Studio, and you can go to the definition of macros, structs, functions, everything, and it will it, it because it can find your headers as well. So it, it'll find functions and. Um, Shader parameters and everything. It doesn't matter where it is, it'll find it in, in the file directory, which is great. Yeah, th this is, you know, this is aimed at making um, rendering engineers, tech artists, um, and other game devs like, like Faith that, uh, like Keith working with, um, with shader code. So, um, last but not least, we have. Um, a list of first-class Unreal Engine integrations to show everyone. Um, for for, do, for those of you that are working in uh, Unreal Engine, I know there's some um, a lovely thing called Blueprint. Um, Keith, can you can can you tell us a little bit more about Blueprint? 
Uh, yep. So Blueprints is Unreal's visual scripting language. Um, so you can derive Blueprint code from C++ codes to allow designers or uh, just gameplay programmers access to your C++ code while allowing um, extension hooks, essentially. So you can you can provide custom logic using Blueprints really quick and easily. Um, it's a great prototyping tool. Yeah, so what, what was life like before um, this was available in Visual Studio? Um, yeah, so usually the workflow with Blueprints is you write your C++ class, um, you provide a few extensions that people can override in Blueprints, um, and then designers and game gameplay programmers, they can go and override that behavior in Blueprints. Um, the problem with that, though, was um, if you wanted to make a change to your base C++ class, that would break everything that depends on it, all the Blueprints. It was actually quite hard to figure out how many Blueprints or what Blueprints you were going to be breaking. Um, what you'd have to do is you'd have to load the editor um, and then do a custom search in the editor. Um, and that's that's pulling you out of Visual Studio. That is spending a bit of time compiling. Um, it, it's it's a context switch, which can be which can be quite annoying whenever you're in the whenever 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 you're in the zone, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, like like Keith said, Blueprint is a visual scripting language that game designers go go and lay out their levels, lay out certain interactions, and just let that um, let that quick iterative process um, that. Unreal Engine with Blueprint gives, um, but then after all that prototyping, it still has to go go to a um, a game dev that works with C plus plus, but like Keith, um, and to basically refactor out all the blueprints um, and switch it out for C plus plus code we all love um, for its performance and reliability. Um, so Blueprint references is just a way of um, avoiding task switching, um, give, give Keith a more opportunity to stay in Visual Studio when he's in the zone. And uh, with that, of course, there's um, streaming of Unreal Logs, um, similar to Blueprints. Um, prior, you have to go to the Unreal Editor and look through all the logs that your, your game is generating. Um, but now, um, you know, you can either just press F5 or press the red record button to capture process. Um, Visual Studio will know that your Unreal Engine game is running in the background and then send over the, the debug logs. You can see here on line 538, I added um, something that says pew, 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 every time a weapon is fired. Um, and with the Unreal log streaming and Visual Studio, you can um, filter your categories, your verbosity, um, and just do some basic man manipulations that uh, you can typically find in the output window. Yeah, Keith, tell, tell us like what's um, what do you like the most about this particular feature? I I really like being able to filter by category and verbosity. Um, so if there's some code that I'm uh, trying to look at the logs for, I can just isolate just those logs and ignore all of the standard uh, logs like garbage collection and um, async loading logs and all of that there. I can just focus on the actual stuff I care about. Exactly. Um, next up is uh, we want to show you a series of a real engine specific code analysis. And to um, we we are building a, a large set of specific code analysis for Unreal Engine projects. Um, a lot of it, you know, we discover through um, conversations uh, with game developers. Uh, I think the theme here is discovering, um, like other code analysis, discovering issues you might have before you hit the compile button. Um, compared to you know, other applications, um, game projects typically large and takes a long time. Um, and you wouldn't want to wait until um, you hit compiler errors. Um, so here, 
we have emitted warnings for Unreal Header Tool. Um, Keith, can you, can you tell people what Unreal Header Tool is? Yep. So the Unreal Header Tool is a tool that's run prior to compiling the Action C++ code. And what it does is it trolls all of your headers for uh, the reflection markup in Unreal. So in this example, you can see U class, the bit, the U class macro, generated body, U function. All of that is to do with Unreal's reflection system. Um, and the Unreal header tool will take all of that markup and generate some C++ code elsewhere to implement th that reflection. Great, um, and you know when you press save, you you'll see some of the Unreal header tool warnings in the error window, um, giving you a chance to address them before you hit compile. Yeah. Um, and coming soon in the newest previews, we are uh, shipping a Unreal Engine naming convention, um, and this is not just for Unreal Engine, but um, and of course we, we know Unreal Engine is quite strict with names, uh, but this can also be applied to uh, whatever naming convention you um, you want for your C++ project. So look forward to a blog post soon about this. Um, but pr let's bring it back to Unreal Engine. Like what's, can you give us some examples about the unique um, naming schemes that Unreal Engine has, Keith? Uh, yep. Um, you can see quite a few of them in this in this example, actually. So if you see a type that starts with A, that means it's an actor. So it's a game object. So A Lyra character is a game object. If it starts with a U, it's a U object, um, which is just a, a, a garbage collected, a, gar, a, gar, a garbage collector known object. Um, you've got U functions. Um, and then for Boolean values, it starts with lowercase b. Um, for regular C++ types, they start with F. Um, funny enough, that's because uh, I think I think I think is because it used to be float. It used to mean float historically. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of specifications in the Unreal uh, naming convention. Yeah, and and if you remember in, in our example um, during the Navis, there there's a property called B hidden. Um, mm -hmm. So the B there is to indicate a boolean. All right, um, and the last but not least is the ability to add an Unreal Engine class. Um, once again, this is you know discovered after talking to Unreal Engine devs that um, sometimes um, the the constant mental switching your your pain when you go into the Unreal editor um, is just um, not efficient. Um, Keith, tell us what what was it like. Um, yeah, so there's there's two ways to add new classes in Unreal. So you could do it through the editor itself. So you'd compile your you'd compile Unreal Engine, start off the editor, and then do add your code from there, and then jump back into Visual Studio. Or the way that I would usually have done it is just literally create the file from scratch in your file directory, um, and then hit generate project files. So um, it's included actually in your project and then start writing all of the lovely boilerplates that every U class or actor has. Um, so it was, it, 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 it's more effort than simply hitting right, right clicking something and hitting add item. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, here you just right click somewhere in the solution explorer, go to add U class, um, which will open the, the lovely little wizard. You give it a name, and then Visual Studio will add your .h, .cpp, and regenerate your project files for you, as is um, typically required by Unreal Engine. Great. Um, I um, So that's it for us. Um, hopefully, uh, through the list of Navis features um, and all of the little handy little productivity tools in Visual Studio, um, we give everyone here a a little idea of what um, just the just the smallest um, glint of what game development is like um, and how productivity tools can be used to um, increase the uh, efficiency. And I think besides everything here that we showed besides the Unreal Engine integrations are very applicable to general C++ programming. Um, so I hope you know, you walked away um, at least, you know, 
um, can try out NatViz if you haven't already. Um, so for, for those of you who are not using Visual Studio 2022, um, go and check it out. Try, try the Unreal Engine integrations as well as the, the new productivity features. Um, our new tool set is binary compatible. Um, you can install it side by side with a older version. Um, but other than that, um, we thank everyone for coming to this game dev productivity session, um, and we'll open it up for questions.